I'm John Little of OmegaShock.com, and this is the Weekend Shockcast for Saturday, September 27th, 2014. Those of you reading your Bibles know that all the big showdowns happen at Jerusalem. The big battles, as well as big covenants, happened there. When it's all over, Satan will have been defeated by God three times at Jerusalem. Satan was defeated first on the cross of our Lord at Jerusalem. Satan will be defeated when Jesus returns at Jerusalem. And Satan will be defeated a third and final time at the very end of the millennium at Jerusalem. And two great covenants were made there. The covenant between Abraham's children and God was made at Jerusalem. The covenant between ourselves and God was made at Jerusalem. Furthermore, God has spoken of how much he loves that tiny place. He said that he loved the gates of Jerusalem more than any other, Psalm 87. He made his name to dwell there, Deuteronomy 12. He spoke of how, during the millennium, Jesus would rule and reign for a thousand years. From there, Zechariah 14, 16 to 21. Of course, Satan always tries to inject himself into what God is doing and corrupt it. He corrupted God's creation at the Garden of Eden when he convinced Adam, via Eve, to eat of the forbidden fruit. He corrupted the covenant made with Abraham by convincing Israel to become idolaters. And likewise, we see Satan corrupting the body of Christ by convincing us to follow lies and heresies. In fact, I believe that it is these lies and heresies that are the chief reason why we are in the last days. We have turned our back on God, so God has removed his hand of protection from us, giving Satan free reign to do with us as he pleases. 1 Corinthians 5.5 5. And just as the idolatry of the Jews caused God to turn from her to the Gentiles, our idolatry has caused God to turn from us back to the Jews. The marker for this was the capture of Jerusalem by the Jews on June 7, 1967. It marks the single most important event since our Lord rose from the grave. It was and is the signpost for the last days. Unfortunately, Satan has yet again inserted himself into the picture, subverting God's clear warning, so that you will be unprepared for what comes. It truly grieves me to see precious brothers and sisters in Christ taking heed to satanic messages that would keep you from understanding what comes. One message would try to convince you that God will whisk you away from any trouble that is coming. The other is that Jerusalem is not a sign and that the return of Israel to her land is nothing. Both of these messages from Satan have found fertile ground in hearts and minds that have already been turned towards the pleasures of this world. We have lost our way and we must repent. For judgment has been decreed against us. If there is to be any hope of escaping what comes, we must open our eyes, turn away from our sin, ask God to forgive us, and walk with the Lord in obedience. We may not escape the consequences of our sin, but we must start now to return to God. Eternity lies before us, and the loss of reward is a terrible price to pay for the temporary pleasures of this life. Life is short. Eternity is long. Choose well. So, what did we talk about this week? This week we talked about New World Order plans revealed in the Georgia Guidestones. Then we launched into the beginning of the last days in 1967 and those who seek to deny that fact. We discussed the vital importance of Jerusalem. We talked about Satan's attempts to confuse the importance of Jerusalem. And then we talked about how this conflict over Jerusalem will destroy those who burden themselves with the ownership of this great city. So let's talk about that. On Monday, it was dire portents, prophecies, and cycles. It can be really hard to know who or what to believe. We can trust God, but we can't always trust our ability to understand what he's telling us. We can trust numbers, but not the reporter of those numbers. We might be able to trust a dream or vision, but not the interpretation. 
Worse, we have lying liars who cloak themselves in righteous robes and tell us tall tales. So it's hard to know what to believe, and from whom to believe it. This age of lies and deception has made it difficult to follow the Lord's command in Luke 21, 36, to watch. Sometimes the only thing that you can do is present the observation, indicate the uncertainty, and allow the hearer to be the judge. So that's what I'll do. I saw a couple things over the weekend that briefly threw me into a depression, and I find that to be a curious thing, because you would think that I would be used to the idea that billions with a B, people, will die, and the place of your birth will be wrecked. But I'm not used to it, and I don't think that I ever will be. The fact that America deserves what's coming makes no difference. I do not want America destroyed, and I do not want God's justified judgment to fall upon the American church. But God did not ask my opinion on this. We have sinned against God, and it is only right that we suffer the consequences of that sin. And part of the consequences of that sin is an America that has been handed over to Satan to do with as he pleases. If you want a biblical basis for what I say, it's here. Quote, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. And in continuing down, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 2, and then 5. There is fornication among us, so God has handed us over for the destruction of the flesh. And we have seen recent evidence that this has been happening. Satan is on the rise in America, and you see the symbols of his growing hegemony everywhere. Worse, his minions have penetrated our churches and spread the counterfeit gospel of a false peace on earth and a fake goodwill towards men. One potent symbol of Satan's rise is the Georgia Guidestones. You've probably heard about the Georgia Guidestones, so I won't waste your time in a lengthy explanation for those of you who haven't heard of this satanic monument, you can go to a Wikipedia page for the Georgia Guidestones. It is a truly vile tribute to the ideals of the satanic elite and right in the middle of the Bible Belt. The fact that this monument still stands, well, it tells us that we have fallen very far indeed. Even more interesting... This monument had its 33rd birthday last year on March 22, 2013. 33 has always been a significant number to the Illuminati, so anything that happens in conjunction with this monument in and around and after that time would also be significant. That's why I consider this to be more than a little ominous. It's a block of stone that was inserted to the Georgia Guidestones labeled 2014. Between 2009 and September of this year, that notch where the 2014 block now sits looked like an empty notch. And now it sits at the corner of the English language portion of the Georgia Guidestones. You can see that they have just begun the process of carving that notch in the above stone in 2009. Why did they wait until now to fill that notch? Could it be that they now know that their plans have finally been set in motion? There is an intentionality to this that is profoundly disturbing. We were alerted to this a few days ago by someone who goes by the name of Kafka Winston World on YouTube. She presented a video of this, and Jordan at RumorMillNews.com picked it up a day later. Then Susan Duclos of AllNewsPipeline.com posted an article about it and Liberty Balance added to the discussion. And that's where I picked it up. When I did some digging, I ran into Kevin McMahon of PeaceGardenSecrets.com, who also did a video. He also offers some interesting background with yet another video. And then Van Smith of Van's Hardware Journal offers up some background as well, and I provide links to all of that in the article. 
Now, all of the occult mumbo-jumbo in the above links and videos is about as valid as um, something that's really not valid. And I only throw it in there because it points to a course of action that they are embarked upon. That is what bothers me. It is just a little bit of confirmation that the Illuminati New World Order elites are moving forward with their plans. And then, as I was chewing on this idea, I stumbled over an interview with Terry Bennett by Rick Wiles of TrueNews.com. In the introduction to the interview, Rick discussed the collision of ominous cycles of war and unrest. Then Terry Bennett came on to talk about a series of dreams and visions that he had in 2001. Terry claimed that it was the angel Gabriel who gave him an outline of events that would happen over the course of 21 years. From 2008 to 2014-15, there would be economic sorrows. From 2015, there would be a time of governmental sorrows until 2021-22. From 2021, there would be a time of religious shaking until 2028. Rick joined in with his own account of the Holy Spirit telling him that we have one year left to prepare. I have a serious disagreement with Rick over his position on Israel, but I do trust his honesty and integrity. If he says that he had a vision of such and so, then I am prepared to accept that he did. It doesn't mean that he interprets his dreams and visions properly, but I trust the fact that he's being honest about it. But he's never claimed that the angel Gabriel came to him with a message. So when Terry Bennett claimed that it was the angel Gabriel who came to him, well, it set off alarm bells. I find it very hard to believe that Gabriel came to him personally with this. Is it possible for Gabriel to come to this guy with a personal message? Of course. Gabriel is a real angel who spoke to Daniel, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And his job is to deliver messages to God's people. But I also know that lying liars also make extravagant claims to capture the weak-minded. Could it be that Terry is telling the truth but misinterpreting parts of his dreams? I don't know. He does give glory to God, and that means a lot, but I still have a feeling that there is something wrong with this picture. I've had prophetic dreams that were incredibly clear and came true in every horrifying detail. So I have no trouble believing that Terry Bennett could have had such a prophetic vision. I just can't say for sure if he's telling us the truth. But even so, I still feel the need to give you the opportunity to decide for yourself. If you have any insight into Terry Bennett or anything, anyone else, please share it with us in the comment section. When we look back on 2014, I believe that we'll all agree that it will have been a pivotal year. We'll see. On Tuesday, it was all over in 1967. No one likes to be told that they are no longer the focus, that their time is past. Think of all the has-been rock stars that make comeback attempts, or the empires that make last-ditch efforts to rekindle what once was. But when God says it's over, it's over. And when you say the words last days, that really is what you are saying. It's over, and it's time for the final scene. And when I look back over the events that brought us to this point in time, I see that 1967 really was that moment in time when the end began. After I struggled through yesterday's article, and yes, it was a struggle, I tried to kick back a bit and listen to some interviews while puttering about on my computer. Since I had profiled an interview by Rick Wiles on TrueNews.com, I thought that I'd check out the next interview. It looked like it would be interesting, and I thought that it might offer a worthwhile counterpoint to what I had written. But I couldn't finish it. I don't know what's the matter with Rick, or with the pastor he was interviewing, but one thing is clear. They are not reading their Bible. If they were reading their Bible cover to cover like they should, they wouldn't be so appallingly ignorant of what it says. And yes, I really mean appallingly ignorant. 
I like Rick Wiles. I like his fire. I like his dedication. But he's completely clueless when it comes to what God is doing with Israel. And I think that the problem is that he isn't reading the prophets of the Old Testament. He's just reading the New Testament. And that's just not good enough. Because most of the prophecies of the days that we are living in now come from those prophets. If you don't know the prophecies of the Old Testament, you will not be ready for the last days. Period. You won't know what time it is. And that describes Rick. Earlier this month, I spoke of a verse that was 1,897 years long. That verse is this one. Quote, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Luke twenty one twenty four. That verse began around February of year 70 and ended on June seventh, 1967. Throughout those 1,897 years, the Gentiles had their way with Jerusalem. It was Gentile law and a Gentile police force that controlled the city, and the Jews were the chew toy of every racist and psychopath in the world. They were driven from country to country and treated like second-class citizens everywhere. But then came 1967, and the world turned upside down for the Jewish people. They were no longer the oppressed, but were now the conquerors, not the conquered. I also find the way that Jesus chose his words to be interesting. He didn't focus on the Jews capturing Jerusalem, but of the Gentiles losing it. Don't you find that to be significant? I do, and I am witness to the fact that the Gentiles do not control any part of the old city of Jerusalem. Not one inch is governed by any law other than Israeli law. Every centimeter is governed, policed, and patrolled by the Jewish state. If you break Israeli law on the Temple Mount, you go before an Israeli judge and go to an Israeli prison. But people like Rick Wiles seem to think otherwise. Why? Is it because they, they don't like the idea that the time of the Gentiles is over? I don't know. But Jesus said it, so I believe it. And no, Jesus did not claim that the Jews would be righteous and holy walking in the truth of God. No, he said that the Gentiles would no longer control Jerusalem. Now, for some of you, that isn't enough evidence, so let me point you to Ezekiel 36, and it is this passage that you need to pay attention to. Quote, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Ezekiel 36, 24-25 my hope is that you understand the word then, because that word should tell you everything that you need to know. Only after the people of Israel enter the land of Israel would God cleanse them. Did you get that? The order of events is this. First, Jews enter land of Israel. Second, Jews are made clean. That is the order of events. Are they clean now? Of course not. Only through Jesus Christ will they be made clean. And the numbers of those who have been made clean are growing. That's right. Born in Israel, Hebrew-speaking Jewish Israelis are becoming true followers of Jesus Christ in greater and greater numbers. The growth may seem small now, but one day it will become an explosion. But that explosion will come when God chooses, not us. And right now I am more concerned for the body of Christ. You. You see, if you don't understand Israel, you don't know what time it is. And it is clear to me that Rick Wiles doesn't know that we are at the end. That we are right up against the very few last years of history. Why do I say that? Because he routinely entertains the possibility that there are many, many years left before the Lord comes. Yes, he does often indicate that the time is short, but it is clear that he doesn't know for sure. Of course, this is perfectly understandable when you don't understand the significance of Luke twenty-one twenty-four, 
and this verse. Quote, so likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Luke twenty one thirty one to 32 When you understand that those two passages fit together, hand in glove, you understand that the amount of time that we have left is vanishingly small, and Rick doesn't get it. Furthermore, I see something interesting. Did you know that the petrodollar did not arise until after 1967? Did you know that our current view of Israel as a regional power didn't happen until after 1967? Did you know that it was almost exactly 40 years after June 7, 1967, that the financial crisis of 2007 began? That last one is interesting. If there is any one single event that will have launched us into the coming New World Order, it will have been that crisis. It's almost as if God had been giving us 40 years to put our house in order before putting the hammer down on us. And no, there are no coincidences. I don't do coincidence theory, and you shouldn't either. Furthermore, I've noticed something important. When you distort one part of the Bible, it distorts everything else. It makes you blind to what should be obvious. And such blindness is painful to listen to, as well as dangerous. People like Rick Wiles are actually standing in opposition to what God is doing, a very, very dangerous thing to do. You may not like what the Israelis are doing. That's your choice. But to speak against the work of God? Ouch. You are in serious, serious trouble if you do that. Very serious. So if you find yourself in such a position, repent and recover yourself. If you don't want to embrace the work of God in Israel, that's your choice. Although I would wonder at how true your love of the Lord is. But at the very least, don't resist God. Resisting God never ends well. But don't just stop at the idea of not resisting God. Go beyond that and walk with God. It is a far, far better thing to get on board with God and be a part of what the Lord is doing. On Wednesday, it was, Why Jerusalem? Having lived there for 15 years, I consider Jerusalem to be home. There is no place on earth that I would rather be. And I would be there now if I could. But I don't really understand why. There are more beautiful places, more pleasant places. There are certainly easier places. But there are no places like Jerusalem. And God has his focus on Jerusalem. Then I don't understand that either. Why would God consider Jerusalem above any other place on earth? I don't know. And no one else does either. Really, no one knows. And the ones who think that they know are, by definition, wrong. When the wheels hit the runway at Ben Gurion Airport, I always feel this sense of relief to be home. I never feel this way about arriving anywhere else in the world, except to a lesser degree, Taipei. I certainly don't feel like I'm coming home when I need to fly back to the U.S., even though that's the place of my birth. I don't have a good explanation for that except to point out the rapid moral decline of America and my love for a good shawarma. Outside of that, I can only say that there's something inside of me that says Jerusalem is the place. Of course, the Bible says that Jerusalem is the place too. In fact, Jerusalem is mentioned 764 times in the Bible. But it's not the number of times that it's mentioned that is important. It's what is said that stands out. For instance, Jerusalem was first mentioned in the Bible in the book of Joshua, which didn't exist at that time. Of course, I find the book of Joshua's eight references to Jerusalem to be interesting. Here's one, quote, Whereas Adonid Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Yarmut, and unto Yaphia, king of Lachish, and unto Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Joshua 10.3 
it's fascinating that the name of the king of Yevus, or Jebus, which would one day be Jerusalem, would be called Adonai Tzedek, or Lord of Righteousness. He clearly wasn't righteous, so I wonder that maybe the place where that city resided was known to be special, which could be why the leaders of that city would have had such a unique name. Of course, I'm speculating. But there is plenty else to say about Jerusalem without needing to speculate. At Jerusalem, Abraham bound his son Isaac to an altar to offer him to God as he was commanded. God stopped him from sacrificing Isaac, and, because Abraham did not withhold his son from God, God said, quote, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Genesis twenty two seventeen and 18. And when Paul was speaking of that moment, he said this, quote, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Galatians three sixteen. So the promise of the coming of Jesus Christ was made there, at Jerusalem. When Gabriel the archangel came to tell Daniel when Jesus Christ would come, he said this, quote, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Daniel 9.25 And no, Gabriel did not mention the building of the temple. It was the city. Jerusalem. That was the point. Then when Jesus spoke of his return, he gave what I believe to be the only sure signpost that we have, that the last days have begun. Quote, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Luke twenty one twenty four. Jesus was telling us that the last days would begin when the Gentiles no longer controlled Jerusalem. Did he mention the Temple Mount? No. In that verse, did he mention anything about a temple? No. Jesus just said, Jerusalem. Jesus then went on to describe the rest of the last days, which would end with his return. And what are the last days all about? The return... Of Jesus Christ. I know that I've been focusing on the death and destruction that will happen between now and then, but that's because I want you to serve God for as long as you can. That doesn't change the fact that the focus of the last days is Jesus, not the Antichrist, not Satan, not anything else. The focus of the last days is the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is the focus. So, is it any wonder that the first signpost of his coming is Jerusalem? No, it's no wonder at all. The problem is that if you don't understand the importance of Jerusalem, then you miss the signpost, which means that you are unable to truly see the lateness of the hour. Why? Because Jesus went on to say this, quote, So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Luke 21, 31 and 32. So it was 47 years ago when the generation clock started ticking. How much time is left on the clock? Not much. Not much at all. Which means that there's about to be a whole lot of shaking going on. On Thursday, it was God and Satan at Jerusalem. The thing that hurts more than anything else is seeing brothers and sisters in Christ preach the message of Satan. It's like a knife in the heart to read and hear satanic error being preached from pulpits and spread on websites. 
Yes, we do get things wrong, and I've been guilty of this myself, but there's a difference between errors of interpretation and outright opposition to God. And the name Satan literally means adversary or the one who opposes. And it has become clear to me that Jerusalem has become a lightning rod in the hearts and minds of those among us who have chosen to oppose God. I marvel at how upset I get at stuff that God said would happen. I don't know whether it's a faith problem or just my unwillingness to accept the inevitable. But whatever the answer is, I just cannot seem to get over the fact that so many precious brothers and sisters in Christ have chosen to hold on to deception in the face of obvious truth. And it really, really hurts to see it. I mean, it's devastating. Whenever I say that such things grieve me, I am not kidding. It really hurts, especially when the Bible is so very, very clear on the subject. In fact, so clear that you really need to reject the words of God to not see what the Bible so clearly states. Unfortunately, this must happen as a part of the process of separating true brothers and sisters from those who are false. Now, does this mean that you are a false brother or sister just because we disagree? No. Of course not. Sometimes we are caught in error and God needs to intervene in our lives to pull us out. That happened to me, so I'm sure that it might happen to you. The point is that God will not leave a true Christian where he or she is if they are caught in something that's wrong. He always throws a lifeline out to those of us who are in it deep and sinking fast. And I also know that some of us have hard heads and require lots of wax from a hammer from God to see the obvious. I'm as hard-headed as they come, so I know what it's like to go through those hammer blows. So I'm not saying that disagreement over the issues that I write about is a sign that you are a false brother or sister. In fact, I'm more than happy to agree that, on some issues, I might be the one who is wrong. However, there are some things that I know that I know that I know are from Satan and not from God, period. And if you preach them, you are preaching a message from Satan and not from God. And yes, you can be a true brother or sister in Christ and preach a message from Satan. Did you get that? You can believe and teach a lie from the devil himself. Only a fool would believe that this is not possible. And yes, you read that right. Only a fool would believe that he is invulnerable to a message of Satan. Why else do you think that God gave us the Bible and told us to read it? Worse, God said through Paul that deception would grow and increase in the last days. In fact, God himself would send deceptions to those who have chosen to have pleasure in unrighteousness. When Paul spoke of our time, he said this, quote, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Second Thessalonians 2, 11 to 12 The word damned in the passage above actually means judged, not sent to hell. The word is krithosin, and the root word is krino, or Strong's 29.19. Of course, a false Christian will be damned to hell, but I hope that none of you are such. What is this judgment that we are talking about? You will be found to have been teaching false doctrine, and you will be caught by what is coming. Everyone will see you for what you are, and you will go to your death knowing that you had led others to theirs. Your sins will be visible for all to see. Those of you who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture lie will be shown that you believed in a lie. Those of you that opposed God's work in the land of Israel will be shown that you stood against God and embraced a lie. Those of you who knew the truth but just could not bring yourself to live it and preach it because the cost was just too high, you'll be shown to have been what you are. And God will have something to say to each of you when you see him. You may not go to hell, but you will suffer great loss of reward for all eternity. Of course, that eternal price should be the scariest of all 
you will have lost reward forever because you could not bring yourself to embrace the truth and preach it. And I am mainly speaking to preachers and writers here. Those of you who were tricked into these false doctrines will not suffer like the ones who tricked you. But I have an interesting and painful observation. These lies will keep you from escaping the Antichrist. And that is as horrifying as it is frustrating. If you look at my earlier writings on this website, you won't find me pounding the table much over false doctrine. I just hadn't come to the full realization of how these lies were keeping you from preparing for the obvious. It just didn't enter my mind that you could be so blinded. That you wouldn't get ready for what was coming. Well, it didn't take long for me to figure this out, which is why I'm banging over the head with my keyboard about this. You will suffer and die, and then face an angry God if you embrace a lie. It's that simple, and I don't want that to happen to you. And what brought all this on was this painful video. New groundbreaking film exposing Zionism, Marching to Zion. Thank you, Michael, for the heads up. Pastor Stephen Anderson, I call you out for preaching a lie of Satan. Yes, you heard that right. I am saying that Stephen Anderson, who I believe to be a brother in Christ, is teaching a doctrine of Satan. And if you believe in this doctrine and follow this doctrine, you also will suffer the same judgment of God right along with Pastor Anderson. Worse, you will face an angry God in the life to come and the loss of reward. To add insult to injury, Stephen is using non-biblical, even satanic, sources to back up his arguments. Rabbis? The United Nations? The Rothschilds? Really? Just because Satan has inserted himself in the process of what God is doing, well, that should not distract us from what God is doing. That's like saying that Christianity is wrong because Mormons call themselves Christian. Yes, it is true that we should not worship Israel. They are not saved, which means that they are still caught by Satan. Israelis will go to hell when they die if they have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But that shouldn't change our view of what God plans to do. Yes, it is true that the Jews preserve the satanic teachings of Babylonian mysticism in their Kabbalah. It's true that the Talmud is full of lies and half-truths. It's true that there are many Jews that have joined themselves with Satan in pursuit of this evil New World Order. All of that is true. But what did you expect? They aren't saved. And anyone who isn't saved is, by definition, in league with Satan. I am mystified as to why this should be so hard for people to figure out. What? You thought that unsaved people should love us? Unsaved people, by definition, hate God and God's people, just as we did before we were saved. In fact, I remember telling my poor mother that I hated God before I was saved. So what is the problem? I'm really not sure. The list of possible reasons is long. One problem is that Pastor Anderson and those like him don't understand that unsaved people hate us and God. And they don't understand that God would bring Israel into the land of Israel while they were unsaved. Yes, that's right. God said that he would bring Israel into the land of Israel before they were saved. Here is what he said. Quote, for I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Ezekiel thirty six twenty four and 25. I talked about this on Tuesday, but it bears repeating. God said that he would clean up Israel after their return, not before. Please, do you understand the difference between after and before? I just don't get why this is so hard to figure out. How can Christians follow such evil satanic lies? And it is so very, very painful to see. And there's something else. 
a place that sits at the heart of this, for reasons that I've said that I do not completely understand. When people like Pastor Anderson talk about the birth of the state of Israel in 1948, they're lifting up a false argument. What happened at that time was just another point along the way towards Jerusalem. It was what happened at Jerusalem that is the key. Yes, the birth of Israel was a furthering of the process of Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37, and that is always important. But the official beginning of Israel was only just one more step. Even the uniting of Jerusalem in the hands of Israel wasn't the final act, but it was a vital signpost for us. And I know of very, very few Christians who are willing to acknowledge this signpost. Why? The list of reasons is long, but the short answer seems to revolve around the idea of not wanting to live in the last days. But God didn't ask you if you liked what he said. He's not asking for your opinion. He's telling you. When Jesus said this, quote, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Luke twenty one twenty four. When he said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, he meant it. You don't need DNA testing to verify that those who control Jerusalem are not Gentiles. You don't need to know about why there's a mosque on the Temple Mount. You don't need to know about the spiritual condition of the Jews that control Jerusalem. You just need to know that the Gentiles do not control Jerusalem anymore. That's it. To choose not to see this is to fall for the lies that Satan wants you to believe. Remember that Satan wants Jerusalem for himself. Why else do you think that the Antichrist will proclaim himself there? And yes, I really did live in Jerusalem for 15 years, and I really am a reliable eyewitness to the facts about Jerusalem and Israel. So please, get this straight. The Gentiles no longer control Jerusalem, and they're hopping mad about that. And that was something that I wanted to talk about today before I got sidetracked. Now, let me make something very, very clear. This isn't about Israel. God will take care of them. God's prophecies always come true, always. So I'm not worried about what will happen there. No, I'm worried about something far, far more important. You. Following such diabolical teachings will cause you to suffer and die and face the wrath of God, something that I have dedicated the last three years of my life to helping you avoid. I do not want you to go through what will happen to you over the next few years because you chose to believe a lie. You must break free of the lies or there will be no hope for you. On Friday, it was Jerusalem, the destroyer of nations. One of the many threads that run through the past 70 years of history is Jerusalem. The world has been desperate to control her and failed every time. The Vatican tried to lay claim and failed. Jordan tried to keep her and failed. Just after her capture by Israel, some Israelis tried to give her away and failed. Almost every American president since then attempted to wrest Jerusalem away and failed. The Palestinians made it the cornerstone of their aspirations and failed. To burden yourself with Jerusalem is to invite utter failure. I lived there for quite a while and watched a lot of this in real time and would have been completely mystified except that the Bible foretold all of this. I am convinced that the Israeli government would give up Jerusalem in a heartbeat if they had ironclad, diamond-hard guarantees of peace. They are as secular as can be and are as religious as a box of rocks. However, the average Israeli isn't like the leadership of Israel and would throw their leaders out should they attempt to compromise the sovereignty of Jerusalem. 
I've watched this happen for myself, and it's quite interesting to see. On the other hand, the Palestinians would have their own state today, and more, if they would give up their irrational claim on Jerusalem. They have been offered everything under the sun and have denied it all because of Jerusalem. And we know that the Antichrist will declare himself at Jerusalem. Everyone is insane over Jerusalem. Amazing. Well, it shouldn't surprise us because God spoke of this through Zechariah. Quote, And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth be gathered together against it. Zechariah 12, 3. And then, quote, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12:9. It is interesting that God doesn't say Israel, but Jerusalem. Yes, Israel is important, very important. But Jerusalem is the key, and if you fiddle with that key, you'll get destroyed. And I love how many try to twist the words of God here in Zechariah to fit their own view of Scripture. Is this the last battle at the end of the millennium? Of course not. You'd have to twist the whole Bible to believe that, which many do. God creates a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem right after that last battle, which means that the events of Zechariah 12.10 through 13.9 cannot fit that last battle. So this is not the end of the millennium. Is this the battle between God and Satan at the end of the tribulation? Of course not. The Antichrist will have already taken over Jerusalem by then, and the Israeli Christians would have fled the city. If anything, God is recapturing Jerusalem from the Antichrist after the tribulation. So what is this? The first, Gog and Magog. The second Gog and Magog, which is in Revelation 20, happens at the end of the millennium, just before God creates a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. So the next question is this. How does God destroy the nations that come against Jerusalem in that first Gog and Magog? It's Ezekiel's fire. That will be the biggest solar flare in the history of the world, and it will be the biggest smackdown that the New World Order has ever seen. They will try to capture Jerusalem and get whacked. You can see evidence of this solar flare here. Quote, and I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel 39, 6. And here, quote, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. Zechariah 12, 4. Along with, quote, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12.9 And here, quote, Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, and healeth the stroke of their wound. Isaiah 30.26 that, brothers and sisters, is a massive solar flare. It's God's EMP attack upon the New World Order, and no one, except maybe in East Asia, will be spared. And did you notice the context of this event in Isaiah? Right, I highlighted it. It's this. In the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. That is is the salvation of Israel. And when you read Isaiah 30, Ezekiel 39, and Zechariah 12, you will notice the same context, the salvation of Israel. Unfortunately, those who reject the coming salvation of Israel won't be ready for this, nor will those who believe that they will be raptured away before the salvation of Israel. Both groups will be completely unready for Ezekiel's fire, and in a sense, they are unprepared because they, too, have burdened themselves with Jerusalem and will be cut in pieces along with the nations. 
The question is whether you will be ready. I certainly hope so, and I am dedicated at this moment to help you wake up to the danger that is fast approaching. I cannot say exactly when this event will occur, but it is not far off. Ezekiel's fire is coming. It will come from God because the nations have gathered themselves against Jerusalem, and because of this those nations will be destroyed. But Israel will be saved. I truly hope that you'll be ready for this. That's a link. There's not much time left. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. Proverbs 22, 3. This has been the Weekend Shockcast for Saturday, September 27th, 2014. I'm John Little of OmegaShock.com, and I hope you have a good week.